as we're born into this world, we develop a habit of seeing that pleasure and pain come from outside. <coughs> And so when pain comes, we look outside for help. And if our parents are there, we learn to depend on them. But the sad truth is that we can depend on them only up to a certain extent. And as we get older, we begin to realize that we have to depend on ourselves. to at least some extent, although we still have that habit of looking outside. It's only when we realize that the world is, as the chant just now said, it's full of aging, illness, and death, and separation. It's a world in which these things are normal. That we take that fifth contemplation of the fifth reflection really seriously, that we live in dependence on our actions. We have to learn how to depend on ourselves, to take refuge inside. And that's why we meditate, is to develop these qualities inside, qualities that we can depend on. In the beginning, it's discouraging. We make up our minds, we're going to stay with the breath. and. It seems like we have many minds all of a sudden, and they're all running off in different directions. It's not all of a sudden, it's the way the mind has been all along. We've got lots of different voices, lots of different ideas, lots of different conflicting opinions inside here. And so no wonder we don't think we can depend on ourselves, that we want to look outside. But the solution is not looking outside, it's learning how to develop the skillful qualities we have inside. Because we all have skillful qualities to some extent. We have a certain amount of virtue, a certain amount of concentration, discernment. And our refuge lies in developing these things to the point where we really can depend on them when they are all around. As John Munn once said, you have to make your practice in the shape of a circle. Keep going around and around and around, and the circle and never ends. In other words, you want your virtue to be like a circle all around. You want your concentration to be like a circle that goes all around you, and your discernment all around you on all sides. It means you have to make your practice timeless something you do all the time. That means looking inward all the time. Always stay in touch with what the mind is doing, what it's up to. As you're sitting here focused on the breath, this means trying to catch it before it leaves. Accept the fact that it's going to have a tendency to leave the breath. That's normal. Be prepared for it. Don't be surprised. But being prepared means that you learn how to look for the warning signs that the mind is about to slip off. It's getting kind of loose and shaky. You might be getting bored with the breath. And you start gazing around to see if there's something else that might be more interesting, like an inchworm who's come to the edge of a leaf. Its back feet are on the leaf and its front feet are feeling out off the edge of the leaf to say, maybe there's something else out there. And as soon as another leaf comes by, gets blown by the wind or whatever, latches on, jumps up to the other leaf. So be prepared for that to happen. And see what you can do to stop it before it's gone on to that other leaf. One way of preventing this is to try to see how interesting the breath can be. There's a lot going on in the breath. It's the energy flow throughout the body. It's not just air coming in and out of the lungs, but there's an energy flow that accompanies the breathing process. 
which actually is the breathing process. And it can involve the entire nervous system. Parts of the body will be blocked off. But you can make a survey to see, well, which parts are blocked off and which ones are in on the breathing. If you have trouble telling, you just go through the body and relax the muscles. Start with the fingers and go up the hands, the wrists, the arms, up to the shoulders. Start with the feet, go up the legs, the pelvis, the back, the neck, the head. Very systematically relaxing the different muscles that you sense there. Wherever there's a sense of tension, anywhere, as you go through the body, just let it relax, relax, relax. And you'll find that the breath then can flow a lot more easily throughout the whole body. This is one way of getting absorbed in the present moment. You see, just this simple process of breathing can be made soothing, energizing. It can be really healing for the body and for the mind as well. You begin to realize that you have friends in here. That the qualities of the body can be used in a way, can be manipulated from a way inside, that are comforting for the mind, absorbing for the mind. It's, it becomes easier and easier to stay here consistently. So you find yourself breathing with a sense of fullness in the body. You're not forcing things too much. Breath comes in, goes out. It tends to get more shallow and quicker. As the breath energy, need, <coughs> breath energy needs in the body are met, you even get to the sense, the point where it seems to stop. And you can just stay there with that sense of fullness. This is the help that concentration can give you. Concentration on its own is not enough. You have to have the discernment to realize that once the concentration has given you the sense of ease and well-being, you're in a good position to look around at the mind's normal preoccupations, its normal understandings of things, and start calling them into question. There's a process the Buddha calls cross-questioning when you—it's it's like examining yourself. In cross-examining yourself, like a witness on the stand, you ask yourself, as you notice the mind slipping off, where are you going? What do you want? What do you expect to get from this? Because the mind is used to slipping out. without anybody in charge at all. It slips out the back door. It's like a child slipping out of the house without asking permission from its parents or telling its parents where it's going. It just goes. But as your mindfulness gets stronger and you feel more settled and stable here in the present moment, you're in a better position to ask, where are you going? What do you want? And as you become more and more honest with yourself about this, you begin to see that a lot of the mind's wanderings are pretty aimless or based on all kinds of misunderstandings. It's in putting up this little blockade like this that you begin to see what its real behavior is and the real motivation for its behavior. And basically the mind wants happiness, that's why it does anything at all. But you can look at its movements and say, well, is it really going to gain any happiness from wandering out like that? And this question is easier to ask when you've had a, a taste of well-being, a sense of rapture and fullness that can come when the mind settles down, so you're not so hungry. If the gatekeeper is hungry too, then when the mind wants to slip out, the gatekeeper will say, well, go out, but bring, bring some bread back for me. But if the gatekeeper is well fed, He's not going to believe this wandering part of the mind so easily. It's not going to be in cahoots with that wandering mind.
So it's this combination of concentration and discernment that helps to counteract that tendency of the mind to go out and look for its gratification, to look for its true happiness outside. This is one of the reasons why we suffer so much in life, as we think that true happiness can be found outside in other people, certain situations, certain relationships. But the relationships can never provide that genuine refuge that we can give 100 percent trust to. Separation is a normal part of life. Disappointments outside are a normal part of life. That's why that reflection that we had just now is only part of the story. In the original passage, the Buddha has us reflect not only the fact that I am subject to aging, I am subject to illness, death, separation. From there, he says to go on to all living beings, men, women, lay, ordained, wherever they are, are subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, subject to separation. And on the one hand, this reflection is it's strangely comforting, because a lot of the pain that comes when we've suffered a loss. Why is this happening to me? It helps take some of the sting away when you realize this happens to everybody. It's not like the universe is focused on making you suffer. It's just simply the way things are. And we've been living in denial of that fact. But at the same time, that reflection, the universality of these things, should give rise to a sense of sangwega, a sense of dismay. This is the way human life is. There must be something better. And that gives us the impetus to practice, to see if we can find that something better inside. We have the seeds for that something better, but they need to be nourished, they need to be cultivated. to the point where we really can depend on them. We depend on the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha to some extent as examples. This is how happiness is found. This is how people have found it in the past. And other people are finding it in the present moment. But for genuine refuge, we have to take the qualities that they develop — mindfulness, alertness, concentration, discernment — and build them up inside. That's when the refuge becomes an inner refuge, something we can really depend on. And when we have this inner refuge, we find that we can depend on ourselves. This is often the case that when we're disappointed outside, it's not just the case that we simply suffer. We can also lash out, latch, <clears throat> lash out at what we don't like, out of disappointment, out of sense of being treated unjustly, and that often creates more problems, just more bad karma. So this practice we do is not just for our own good, in the sense of finding a reliable sense of comfort inside, but it also means that we can become more reliable in our actions, the things we do and say and think, so that regardless of what's happening outside, we can re behave in a responsible manner, <coughs> a harmless manner. So meditation is a gift. It's an expression of goodwill. Whether we consciously spread thoughts of goodwill to other beings or not, the fact that we're training our mind is a sign of goodwill for ourselves, and that we wish well to other people. 
that we're going to take responsibility for our minds. We're going to learn how to develop reliable qualities inside. The benefits that come from that are not only felt inside, but they spread around outside as well. <laughs>